So, uh, I think maybe a tender finger-picking ballad, something deep, something from deep within that makes you just cry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Greg Kim. Welcome to Wolfgang's Vault. I'd like to do a song that put both of my kids through college and partial grandchildren as well. We'd broken up for good just an hour before. Uh 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 uh. Yeah, I like this. This is it. It's working out so far. So good. All right. Now I'm staring at the bodies as they're dancing across the floor. Uh 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 Cause they don't run my back anymore. And they haven't since 1984. They just don't ride them like that anymore. It was, a, it was a number one record uh, in 1983. I was only 12 years old at the time, and I don't remember much. But it's become more difficult to sing over the years. So what I thought I'd do here for you guys is just do kind of a different finger-picking arrangement of it. Visualize Jeopardy 
played by Andre Segovia and sung by Mark Knopfler. <laughs> the Knopfler part right there. Where were you when I needed you? You could not be found. What can I do? Well, I believed in you. You're running me all around. Well, you can take it as a warning. Take it any way you like Cause it's the lightning, not the thunder You never know where it's gonna strike I love you Wolfgang's Vault. My name is Greg Ken, and I've got a tune to sing for you. God, that sounds corny. Thank you. directions. I think we'll stay in the Bo Diddley groove though. Here we go. Say hey, Mona. Oh, Mona. I say yeah, 
Brad Town from Wolfgang's Vault, and I am honored to be sitting here with Greg Kinn, a local legend who just played a great set for us here at the Vault. Greg, thanks so much well, for being here. Well, thank you, Brad. <laughs> God bless you, sir. So we love to claim you as one of our own here in the Bay Area, but you're originally from Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore right? originally, but you know, I cut my teeth in the Bay Area. Came out here in '71, and uh, you know, I I just became, but it was a scene. And I just became part of the scene. You know, the band was put together, I think, about 75, and we played our first gig. First album came out in 76, I believe. And, uh, you know, we'd always been a Bay Area band. You notice how Bay Area bands are regional. You had your Marin bands, like right. like Huey, yep. Sons of Champlin, Marin, right? You, uh, you had your East Bay bands, Earthquake, the Greg Kinn band, uh, you know, Ruben Ooze. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had your San Francisco bands, you know, you had your South Bay bands like the Doobies. That's what the, the great thing about the Bay Area. It's a great scene, man. And I just plugged right in. I said, I didn't even have a band. I was just doing a folky thing, being a right. singer songwriter. And the, the, the guy, Malcolm, that used to own the Long Branch said, man, it's a shame you don't have a band. Because I need somebody to be the house band here. Eddie Money just kind of graduated. Eddie had been the house band at the right. Long Branch. He said, you know, Eddie's leaving. You know, if you had a band, I could, I could plug you in. I said, well, I got a band. I got a <laughs> great band. I didn't. Uh, I went out and put a band together in one week. That band stayed together for 15 years and made 10 albums oh, wow. and had a whole bunch of hit records. So go figure. Yeah, that's pretty lucky you know, to turn it around that fast. <laughs> it was, you know, it was all the, the great rock and roll is not planned. It just happens. No, I, I you know, agree. and I learned that to not fight it, just let it happen. All right, is it time to talk about Bill Graham? <laughs> we can tell the truth about Bill. I loved Bill Graham, maybe more than most of. You know, I know that. For instance, he was he was directly involved with Eddie's career, mm-hmm. so that he couldn't really Eddie can't be objective. I, on the other hand, a complete outsider, really, uh, and I knew Bill, and I and and we always got along. the f- The first time that I got Bill's respect, it was the first gig we ever played for, for like our first big gig was at Winterland, and he called That's me up gig. in the afternoon. He said, "Hey, Cheap Trick canceled because Robin's got." Laryngitis. Can you guys be set up and ready to go by seven thirty? I said, "Yes." What door do we go with? You know what? I what? I was there. We go. Well, I didn't even think about who the headliner was as we drove up on the marquee. Black Sabbath. I'm out there with my acoustic twelve string doing songs like you know Moon Shadow, and people are like giving me the finger and they're throwing stuff and they're just they're chanting and they're lighting candles and they hated me. They hated me. And I come off the stage and Bill's standing there and I go, Bill, 
Come on, man. Why did you put a song with Sabbath? He goes, I just wanted to see what you were made of. And he says, yeah, I needed a warm body. You guys were available, and I wanted to see if you could take it. And we took it. And he said, look, you're still standing, aren't you? You know, and I, ironically, I was. Of course, they threw everything at me. <laughs> but the beautiful thing was, as the years went by, we became one of Bill's favorites, and mm -hmm. we opened hundreds of shows at Winterland. As a matter of fact, we... The last, remember the end of Winterland, the final, final day? It was a six hour concert by the Grateful Dead. Yeah. Incredible show. It's been documented. You can, the, the video is available, probably through Wolfgang's vault, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the night before. The night before Winterland closed, it was the Greg Kin Band and Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Great. Now, that was a great gig. <laughs> Both bands were prime. And we'd, we'd both been veterans of Winterlands. We played there a million times. And, we, and the place was sold out. It was just a great show. And everybody's taking souvenirs. People are unscrewing whole, you know, st st uh, strips of seats. You know, like they were like bleacher seats, right? right. They, were, they were like baseball seats. And they were taking them right out in front of Bill, right under his nose. And Bill was like smiling and waving because he knew that the, 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 the building had a date with a wrecking ball. Yeah, and right. there was no reason to... Don't take those seats. So people are getting crazy and they're taking everything. They're taking <laughs> doors. They're taking. So I'm in the dressing room, and and this is okay. Flashback to why Bill Graham liked Greg to begin with. Because one time after a gig, my mother always told me when she was alive, God bless her soul, always thank Bill Graham at the end of every gig. If he throws you a bone, you go and say thanks for the gig, Bill. So I go and I'm I'm going looking for him to thank him. And he's talking to Bar one of the Barsodis. <laughs> so he's talking. And I come up one Bill, and he's got a white thing right here. Like a little white thingy. And I walk up, and I go, and he, and he kind of, he's talking to Barsodi, and he looks over and goes, hey, Greg. I walk up, and I go, hey, Bill, white thing. Right there. Right there. Right, white thing. He goes, he looks at Barsodi, he goes, I've been talking to you for 10 fucking minutes? You don't tell me I got a white thing? This punk walks up first thing out of his mouth. You got a white thing? You're fired! It was a great sign. I kind of backed away. I didn't know what to say. I just kind of walked into it. Of course, he rehired him the next day. Bill was famous for that. But, so I'm looking for Bill to say thanks. You know, I didn't want another white thing incident, but... You know, I, I'm sitting in the back room, and we're looking in the mirror. You know, the back rooms, there was two dressing rooms at Winterland, one on either side of a big communal room. Okay. And everybody and his brother had primped in this mirror. I'm looking in the mirror. Me and Steve were smoking a joint. We're looking in the mirror. And he's going, I see, I see Janice. Janice looked in this mirror. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix primped in this mirror. Jim Morrison shaved in this mirror. This mirror is magic. We have to steal it. <laughs> so I got, I mean, I get my roadies out. We get, we get a couple of Phillips head. And, I'm, and it was a door-sized mirror. It was big. Right. And we uh, it took a long time and we scraped it and unscrewed it and gently removed the mirror. And I'm thinking, man, this mirror is Hall of Fame. Uh, this is going to go in my house, and I'm going to have Winterland Mirror. I'm going to have Bill sign the bottom of the mirror. This mirror is gold. The stones primped. Brian Jones primped in this mirror. I mean, this mirror is it. So we're trying. There was an underground parking garage, and I had an Alfa Romeo. You can see the end of this story. <laughs> and me and a couple of guys gently carried it down and put it in the Alfa, took the top down, so it's sticking out like a door. And of course, I get in there, and I this I was living over here on. Uh, I was living over by uh, Cal Hollow on Laguna Street, and in the middle of the night, I'm driving. I go about one block, and the the whole thing shatters into a million pieces. And I was pulling shards of that mirror out of my Alfa Romeo for ten years. <laughs> you know, they say if you broke a mirror, you get seven years bad luck. I'm telling you. To three divorces, come on, a couple of bankruptcies, it, they ripped me a new one it was because of that freaking mirror, man. If I had just not taken the mirror, I mean, you know, John, Janice and Jimmy, they wanted to stay 
in the mirror. But I broke the mirror and mm -hmm. released them out to the world, and karmically I had to pay the price. <laughs> and that's why Bill Graham liked me. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, Any other I, questions, Brad? I don't know how to follow that up, honestly. <laughs> uh, you know, I got to tell you, the beautiful thing about Wolfgang's Vault, there's so much history here. And you know True. what? You, as rock and roll grows up, you've seen what's on television. You've seen Lady Gaga. This stuff has to be maintained like the pyramids. You know, this it's like the pyramids, man. You've got to maintain this historical stuff. And by the way, I want all the Greg Kin posters you got here. <laughs> <laughs> well, put them in the back of the Alpha, with yeah. the, right under the mirror. <laughs> hey. um, well, so we've kind of covered a, a bit of the, the music history, but now you've kind of you also at a certain point transitioned into DJing yeah. locally here. So, kind of how did that how did that transition happen? Well, Larry Sharp hired me to. I was filling in for somebody doing seven to midnight at a little mom and pop station called K Fox in San Jose. Sure. Larry Sharp was the program director. Well, wow. he hired me, and then the station had started getting bought by different people. And it, every time they sold it, it got to a bigger. And finally, uh, after a year doing seven to midnight, they offered me the morning show. This was in 1993 or four. And I've been doing the morning show for the last, what, 17 years or 16 years or something? It's ridiculous. I get up at 4 in the morning for that long. I used to go to bed at 4. <laughs> I get up then. And it's, but I got into the idea that, kind of like the vaults here, you know, it was part of history. Sure. And I, it, it was a legacy, 20 years of rock and roll. And finally now, the whole thing has come full circle because the little station, the little mom and pop station that I signed up for was purchased by Clear Channel and then recently purchased by Entercom. And Entercom is, uh, they've, they've moved us up here into San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I'm in these palatial penthouse studios. It's the big leagues. You know, and, and I had just, you know, and like, like everything else in rock and roll, it wasn't planned. It just happened. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to kind of come home to San Francisco after spending 14 years in the South Bay. And, uh, you know, my career, I mean, I've always been blessed with this creative bug. You know, I write novels. I got a screenplay. We're going to make a movie next year. Yeah, no, we'll be around right. for that movie coming out next year. <laughs> um... I've written a couple of novels. I do the morning show on K Fox and probably will continue to do that for years to come. I just feel like my ship came in. I wasn't looking. It wasn't scheduled to come in. It just mm -hmm. came in. You know, and now I get up in the morning and, and, the, and half of me is cursing the world because it's, I get up at 3.45. <laughs> and the other half of me is saying, God bless you. This is a great job. People would die to have your life. I mean, what a great life. You know, I recently became a grandfather. Oh, Me, great kin. A grandfather. I know that's shocking. And, and it really gives you a feeling of continuity. And here I am now with K Fox moving into the big leagues and coming up to San Francisco. So now we're on two state, we're on two uh, frequencies, 98.5 oh, really? in San Jose. And we're now simulcasting a 1021 in San Francisco, right. which really covers us all the way from Santa Rosa to Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a huge, a huge amount of people. And to be able to address them every morning and to go to work with them. So, like, I know. I feel like I know these people and they know me. You know, half of them I probably owe money to and the other half <laughs> saw me at a gig somewhere. Yeah, right. The number one thing when guys come up to me or anybody comes up to me, they always come up and they say, April 12th, 1979. I saw you, man. You were great. They always got dates. People come running. Oh, God, New Year's Eve, 1983, dude. Cow Palace loved you. <laughs> oh, there's a good story. Bill Graham built this flying V gondola guitar that I was going to get in. It was big. It was as big as these couches. And it, and it was on a cable. And I was at the Cow Palace. He took me all the way to the top of the Cow Palace on the catwalk. And I'm afraid of heights. I went up there, and Bill, took, he said, I said, Bill, I can't do it. I can't do it. He says, you're doing it. He just grabbed me by the hand, dragged me out there, put me in the guitar, and I'm like white knuckles. The guitar was like very small, and it was swinging, and I'm on a cable at the top of the cow palace, and he goes, bye, Whoa! and the cable, the guitar slides down the cable. <laughs> at, a, at a given moment, I think about 
15 seconds before midnight, suddenly the spotlight hits me. Balloons are falling, and hey, here comes Greg down the cable. And just as I hit the stage right at midnight, boom, all the, you know, the, the balloons come down, the confetti goes off. And I'm, you know, I tell you, I almost peed in my pants. In fact, I may have passed a little water. Going down that cable, yeah, I can and I was high, man. It, this was back. This was '83. I, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not condoning the use of these substances. But back in the '80s, we were known, and and uh, Bill Graham just put me in that cable and shot me down there. It was unbelievable. Oh wow! I got a million Bill Graham stories, but I better stop. You know, while while my stock still has some value well, here, yeah, we, we could listen to these all day. But thank you so much for being here. Um, it's really been a pleasure and an honor. I mean, uh, thank you so Why, much. thank you, Brad. All right, and thank you all, and thanks thanks to Wolfgang's Vault for making all this possible.